Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. Although it's a little rainy and bad on the outside, it's good to be here on the inside of God's house to worship the Lord. We welcome every one of you, members and visitors alike. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. I'm hoping during the hour coming up we can be a real inspiration to you in song and the Word of God. And if you'd call a friend and have them to tune in and get this hour, we'll try to be a blessing to them. I believe we can. You'll be doing them a favor. And I want you to take your Bible and turn to two places in the Word of God. Turn to Isaiah chapter 30 and 1 Peter chapter 4. Now the singing and the message will be on cassette tape. And the tape is number 202. If you'd like to have the cassette tape for today, both message and the uh, music, you write in and close a gift of $3 for the tape. And request it, we send it right to you. I'm speaking today on the seven judgments. The seven judgments. I want you to listen closely and find out what they are. Write in and get some cassette tape. We have a list of about 200. We'd be glad to send you a list of our tape. We'd gladly send you one of our brochures on a proposed Holy Land tour. You might want to take a look at that. This is a faith ministry. We depend upon you that love God to help us keep the gospel going out day by day. We're now in our 38th year of daily broadcasting from the classic city of Athens, Georgia. A door opened of God and God's raised up people in the past 38 years to help us get the gospel out. We stand together at the judgment seat of Christ and be rewarded for all the good that's done. Now I want you to pray for me and write to me. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards. P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603, is the zip code number. We'd like to hear from you next week. Olike Brown had two wives. One of them was named Millie, the other Tilly. They died. He, they buried Millie, and then they buried Tilly. Olike said to the undertakers, he said, Now, when I die, I want you to bury me between Millie and Tilly. I want you to take a rule and measure tape and be sure you put me right between the two, just to the very each. But if you happen to miss it just slightly, then just tilt me toward Tilly and let it go at that. Now today, I want to ask you to do something on Tuesday. You that live in the city limits of Athens, Georgia, I want you to go to the polls on Tuesday and vote no in regard to this liquor issue. Now the liquor crowd, the liquor heads and the beer bellies and the winos and all the crowd that don't give a hoot about how many drunks you have on the highway, all they concern is about the money they can get out of it. They want to uh, extend the time of selling liquor and set it on Sunday. And it's wrong, it's wicked, it's evil. 76 times in the Word of God, God speaks against alcoholic beverages. 76 times it's clear in the Bible. God is against it. The Bible, of course, is against it. Common decency is against it. God's people is against it. Law-abiding citizens are against it. And it's wrong to sell alcoholic beverages of any kind. And now the liquor heads, they want to extend that time into Sunday. All they're concerned about is the money they get out of it. They come with the same old song and same verse and same chorus on uh, we need the tax money, we need to do this to get uh, uh, more conventions in town and more tourists in town and on and on they go. Well, if you got to take a, a jug of liquor to entice tourists and conventions and people to come to Athens and the people to put industry in Athens, you don't need that bunch of drunks. We don't need a bunch of drunks to come here to do business. We got too many of them now. Now you go to the polls Tuesday and vote no, you people that live in the city of Athens, Georgia. That's your responsibility. You ought to do it. You ought to yourself to do it. If you don't do it, the liquor crowd 
is going to get that time extended, get a referendum, and the devil's the god of this world system, and they're going to get their crowd out to vote it in. And so you need to do something about it. During the Korean War, I believe it was, there's a couple of servicemen came into Charleston, South Carolina, and they hadn't been home in a long time. They'd been at war, and they, uh, two of these men rushed to the phone booth to call their parents, and they called their parents, and they said, we are in Charleston, and we're on the way home. We can hardly wait to see you, Mom, and hardly wait to see you, Dad. And uh, Mom and Dad said, oh, son, I'm mean, so good to hear your voice again. I'm glad you called. We'll be looking for you. Just come right on, son. We're so glad you're back in America. Those two young servicemen stepped on the outside of that phone booth, and just as did so, a drunk ran off the highway, ran into them, pinned them against the phone booth, and killed both of them instantly. Now, what the communists could not do in Korea, the liquor heads did it here in America. Amen. The Bible says, Woe is that man that puts a bottle to his neighbor's lips. God is going to hold every man responsible that drinks the stuff. He's going to hold the men responsible that sell the stuff. He's going to hold men responsible that rent their buildings or build their bills and sell it in. He's going to hold people responsible that vote for it. And the Bible said, Cursed is every man that puts a bottle to his neighbor's lips. And I don't want a curse on me. That's why I'm against it. I'm against it because God is against it. Common sense is against it. The Bible's against it. And I don't want a curse on me. And there's already a curse being put on this nation because of alcohol. And people today are drunks on the highway. They're drinking more and more. And about one out of every two people you meet today on the highway either drink or under dope or been drinking or have access to strong drink and you see the danger we're in. Now what's happening, we need to talk about uh, doing something about the drunks on the highway and turn right around and vote the stuff in and vote time for them to set it, extend that time. Beloved, a man looks stupid in the kitchen and the faucet running and the water running out of the sink and he's trying to mop it up and don't have sense enough to cut the faucet off. Now that's where it is, this liquor crowd. See, they trying to mop up the water in some places and still won't cut the faucet off. Now you go uh, Tuesday and do your part to cut the thing off. That's the only way you're going to stop it or uh, help, to, help to stop it and keep it from flowing in Athens, Georgia. We don't need more liquor in Athens. We have the students here. We have our high school students and young people. We got too much of it now. That crowd lied to the people back years ago when they wanted to put in liquor stores and said we'll just have a certain number of liquor stores established and that'll be it and then uh, we'll take that and reduce your taxes. Did they do it? No, sir. They had put in more liquor stores and they said they would and taxes just kept going up. The liquor crowd is not going to tell you the truth. They'll tell you a lie because they're concerned about the money they get out of it. That's it. They don't care anything about your family, your children getting killed on the highway, your youngins becoming a, a drunks or having to uh, be sent to mental institutions because of alcohol. They don't care about that. They could care less about that. All they want is the money, then get out of it. And God's people need to go and vote no on Tuesday. And if you live in the city limits, you go and vote no. Now, some of that liquor crowd out there now in the radio listen audience, they're blazing mad. They don't like what I'm saying. But if they don't like it, they can lick it, lump it, leave it, or whatever they want to do. It's the truth anyhow. And so let's do what we should do. Now, in Isaiah chapter 30, we have a verse of Scripture I want to read to you. Isaiah chapter 30. And look what this verse of Scripture has to say. As soon as I can turn to it, you may turn to it right quick like Isaiah chapter 30. And there's a verse of scripture that I want to read to you. And it's verse, um, uh, verse 18. And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you. And therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Bless all they that wait for him. The Bible said the Lord is a God of judgment. Now I want to read from 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning with verse 17. Page 1315. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. 
And if it first began at us, what shall the end be of them to obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, why shall the ungodly and sinner appear? And so the Bible says there's a judgment, and judgment must begin, he said here, at the house of God. There are seven outstanding judgments mentioned in the Bible, and I want to present them to you today, and I want you to hear and get what God has to say about it. The Bible says the point of the man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. The Bible has a lot to say about judgment. Judgment number one is a judgment of the believer's sin. Now you may say, preacher, what do you mean by that? Well, in the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 31 and 32, it said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Now that took place on the cross at Calvary. That was a judgment of the believer's sin. Now the Bible said that it must be judged. Sin must be judged. Sin that must be paid. No man can go to heaven unless that sin that is taken care of. Man came here a sinner. Man came here without God. Man uh, turned away from God. The Bible tells us, and God said, the sin that must be paid for, there must be a judgment on sin. God said, I must judge sin, or uh, nobody can go to heaven. And God chose to send His Son down from heaven, and let the people nail him to an old rugged Roman cross and let him shed his own blood that that blood might atone for sin. That's when God judged the believer's sin. Every sin that you ever committed or ever will commit was judged and paid for right there on Calvary. That's the believer's sin paid for past, present, and future. There had to be a judgment. And the only thing God would accept was the atoning blood of His Son. All through the Old Testament, the high priest came and brought a little lamb. And once a year, he would cut his throat and take his blood and go into the Holy of Holies and place that blood on the altar. And God would look over the sins of the human race for another year. That is, the sins of Israel. And so at the end of that year... That priest would once again take the blood of an innocent animal, carry that into the Holy of Holies. Another year God would look over that sin. But God was only uh, looking over that sin until it could be paid for. In due time, God sent His Lamb. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And God sent His Lamb that had come from heaven. And that Lamb was Jesus Christ. In his veins ran the blood of God, perfect blood. And he went to the cross and he paid the sin debt for the believer. As you sit here today, a believer in Christ, a born again Christian, every sin that you've ever committed and ever will commit has been paid for with the blood of Jesus Christ there on Calvary. Now you need to realize that that was judgment. That was God's judgment, judging the believer's sin. And our sin was so hideous, so bad, so ungodly, until it took the blood of God's Son to take care of it. The Bible said silver couldn't do it. The Bible said gold couldn't do it. Good morality couldn't do it. Good works couldn't do it. It had to be done by the blood of God's Son. So God paid for your past sins, your present sins, and your future sins on the cross Every bit of it's been paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's the only way you can go to heaven. That is the first judgment. The second judgment is the believer's judgment of himself. Now God said the believer needs to take stock and judge himself quite often. The word of God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 31 and 32. If we judge ourselves we shall not be judged. But when we're judged, we're chasing the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Now those Christian people, those saved people back in the church at Corinth, they had gotten out of the will of God, many of them. Many of them over drinking at the Lord's Supper. Many of them getting drunk. Many of them taking their brothers and sisters to court. And many of them split over preachers. And they were in bad shape. And God said through Paul in writing the church at Corinth, God said to those believers there at Corinth, 
You need to check up and see where you stand. You're doing things that you shouldn't do. You need to judge yourself and see what you're doing wrong. Now he said, if you don't do that, God said, I'm going to judge you and then chastise you. Not to judge them whether or not they were saved or lost. That took place when they were born again. Jesus paid that sin on Calvary, but to judge their lives in order to chastise them if they fail to judge themselves. Now when they judged themselves and found what they were doing wrong, the Bible said if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now when they judged themselves, those that confess their sins, God cleansed them from all unrighteousness. But those that failed to judge themselves and continued on in disobedience when God told them not to, then they died a premature death. Many of them became sickly and many of them died, many of them in ill health because of their sins. They were in a terrible turmoil there in the church at Corinth. And that was one of the most sinful churches you find in the Bible. All through the book of 1 Corinthians, you find they had one problem after another. And God told them to judge themselves and straighten up. Now that's what God is saying to his children. That's the believer's judgment of himself. Now we come to judgment number three. And that is the judgment of the believer's works. This Bible over and over again tells you that you need to be a faithful worker a good steward of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And whether you know it or not, God is keeping a record of the believer's works. God has a book in heaven and all of your works and all of your good deeds and what you do to glorify Him, God keeps a record of that. God has that record. Now God is going to judge that record and that judgment is going to take place at the judgment seat of Christ. The Bible says in Romans chapter 14 and verse 10, but why does thou judge thy brother? Or why does thou say it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Paul said we shall all stand, including himself. We stand at the judgment seat of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 13 through 15, Every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. And if any man's work abide, which is built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now that's the judgment of the believer's work. You may say, preacher, when will that happen? That'll happen immediately after the rapture. All true believers will be ushered to the judgment seat of Christ. And that's in heaven. And we'll stand there to have our works judged. We're not going to stand there to have our sins judged. That was judged upon the earth. We'll stand there to have our works judged. We're not going to stand there to see whether or not we're saved or lost. We're not going to stand there to see if our good deeds will outweigh our evil deeds. All of that takes place on the earth. Beloved, we will stand there that God might scrutinize our works. God is going through our works. God's going to look over our works. He has a record of it. God has a record of every good work you ever done for Him. God has a record of every penny you've ever given into His work. God has a record of every good deed you've ever done toward God's people. The Bible said you could give a drink of cold water in the name of the disciple and you wouldn't lose your reward. God Almighty has that record. And as you serve the Lord, God keeps that record. Now you may say, preach Edwards, why will God judge our works? God will judge your works for this reason. Not to check up to see whether you go to heaven or hell. That's determined down here. You're already in heaven. There won't be one sinner there at the judgment seat of Christ. Not one. Only saved people. And God is judging your works. Now why is God judging your works? Why will He do that? He'll do that for one purpose. God's going to pass out rewards. God's going to give out um, crowns. God's going to decorate His children. And your decoration or your crown or your reward in eternity will determine as to what you do for God down here. 
Now there will be some saved people there that had an opportunity to do things for God here and didn't do it. They're going to be shamed at his appearing. There'll be some there that's built up on a false foundation, maybe got carried away into some cult, and then got twisted up in the scriptures and failed to rightly divide the word of truth. Beloved, listen to me, that's going to be burned up. That'll be burned up at the judgment seat of Christ. One of our ladies uh, this morning telling me about a, a certain evangelist um, on his program. He was uh, speaking in tongues. Now, beloved, tongues cease about 70 AD. There's been no biblical tongues since that time. Now, there's nobody speaking in biblical tongues today. Now, what he was doing, he was doing something he had memorized and he's done many times. And if you ever heard him, he's always said the same thing over and over again. And he'll have those poor people out there seeking for a baptism that they might speak in tongues, which is error. All of that will go up in smoke at the judgment seat of Christ. The man is a good preacher. He's a hard hitter. He preaches against sin, but he's twisted up in some of his doctrine. He believes in that unknown tongue, and that's C 70 AD. We don't have any unknown tongues today. No tongues today was, it wasn't unknown in those days. People knew what they were saying. And beloved, they're trying to preach and teach that you have to seek after the baptism that you might speak in tongues. That is very, very unscriptural. You have no Bible for that whatsoever. Tongues have ceased. Tongues were assigned to Israel. And when Israel left the land, tongues were assigned to the unbelieving Jew. When they were scattered over the earth, the tongues ceased and there had been no more biblical tongues. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 8 tells you they would cease and they did cease. And so all of that kind of stuff's going up in wood, hay, and stubble. Only the scriptural things are going to remain. Now, I believe this preacher is a saved man, and no doubt he's a call of God to preach. And all the good things that he does, he'll be rewarded for it. But that error he teaches, like the tongues and falling from grace and sinless perfection, and all that kind of stuff, will be burned up because it's error. It's not according to the Bible. And he's a hard-hitting preacher against sin. I appreciate that. He has a good musical program. I like to hear his musical program. Were it not for his musical program, he wouldn't have a, uh, the crowd he's having. Now, I'm for all the people that get saved. I'm for all the people that he helps and blesses. But I'm not for the false doctrine he preaches and teaches. I watch his program occasionally. I like to look at it, enjoy the music. I like to hear him bust the hides of, of people that's committing sin. I like to hear him do that. I'm for him. I say amen. But I'm not for his false doctrine on the tongues and falling from grace and sinless perfection, all that kind of stuff, because it's unscriptural. Now, beloved, all of that unscriptural stuff is what God is talking about that's going up in smoke. And if you are doing a teaching or working on false doctrine, that'll be burned up. Only that is based on sound doctrine is going to survive and you'll be rewarded for at the judgment seat of Christ. And that's immediately after rapture. Now we come to judgment number four. And that's a judgment of Israel. In Ezekiel chapter 20 verses 33 and 34. As I live, saith the Lord, surely with a mighty hand. And with stretched out arm with a fury poured out will I rule over you. And I will bring you out from the people. And will gather you out of the countries wherein you're scattered. With a mighty hand with stretched out arms and with fury poured out. Now God is going to judge the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel led in the crucifixion of the Son of God. God said if they disobeyed Him, they would be scattered. In 70 AD, Titus, the Roman general, came and captured Jerusalem and scattered Israel and carried them captive all over the known world at that time. They crucified so many Jews in Jerusalem that day until they ran out of crosses. And beloved, they carried the, what was left into their lands and scattered them. And God said you wouldn't be scattered. But God said in the end time, I will bring you back home. And now they're going back home. But God said you'll be coming back in unbelief with the scales still over your eyes. And that Jew is going back home with the scales over his eyes. And during the tribulation period, of course, at the beginning of the tribulation period, they'll be deceived by the Antichrist. They will think he's the true Messiah and they will receive him, make a covenant with him for seven years. At the end of three and a half years, the, the Antichrist will break that covenant and demand that they worship him and he'll move in the temple and claim he's God and then there'll be rebellion against the Jew 
And then Jesus Christ is coming back to judge Israel. God's going to judge that nation when he comes back and they'll see him. Realize they crucified the Messiah 2,000 years ago. They'll weep and they'll wail and they'll repent and they'll ask God for forgiveness. God will judge the nation of Israel. That time is coming. They're most certainly going to be judged as a nation. Now let's move on to judgment number five. And that's a judgment of the nations. The Bible says there's coming a time when the nations will be judged. In Matthew chapter 25 verses 31 through 46. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory. And all the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them one from another. As a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Now when Jesus Christ comes back to set up his kingdom upon the earth. Right there in Jerusalem. He's going to judge the nations. That doesn't mean that all the people from all the nations will come. To, no, no. Because most of the sinners will be destroyed during the tribulation period. There are not going to be a lot of people on the earth at the end of that tribulation period. Sinners will be destroyed during the tribulation period. They will be slaughtered by the millions. But there will be a representative of many different nations in Jerusalem... When Jesus judges these nations, they have to valley of Jehoshaphat. Now he, he's going to judge these nations. There in that valley today, there are uh, three cemeteries. One for the Christian, one for the Jew, and one for the Muslims. Now the reason they want to be buried there, they know this judgment is going to happen there. And Jesus will come for the judgment. They believe that they'll be raised right up on the grave and be judged. And that's why they're buried there. But these nations will be judged. A representative of these nations from many parts of the world will stand there before God. And they'll be judged and they'll be recognized as a, uh, a sheep nation or a goat nation. The goat nations are the nations that persecuted that Jew and failed to help God's people. The sheep nations are those that helped the Jew and helped God's people. That's a judgment of the nations. Now, number six, we have the judgment of angels. Now, there's some angels that's coming in the judgment. The Bible says in the little book of Jude, verse six, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he has reserved an everlasting chains on the darks unto the judgment of the great day. Now, there's some angels that lined up with the devil, and they lost their bodies, and their weakened spirits and demons, and there's some in chains of darkness, Waiting for the judgment of that great day. At the end of the millennium. At the close of the thousand years reign of Jesus. Those angels are going to be brought before God. And God will judge them. The time will be at the millennium. The place will be in heaven. God will judge these angels that rebelled against him. God is going to judge these. And according to the Bible, they will be cast into the lake of fire. These fallen angels must be judged and they go into that lake of fire according to the Bible. They'll be judged because they lined up with the devil and rebelled against God. And about a third of them in heaven did that when Lucifer became the devil and God kicked him out and God kicked out a third of the angels and they're the ones going to be judged and they'll be cast into the lake of fire and also will the devil be cast into the lake of fire. He knows that. That's why he's working now to deceive sinners and working against God. He hates God. He hates God's people doing everything he can against God. Now that's judgment number six. Judgment number seven is the judgment of the wicked dead. There'll be millions of people to be judged at the judgment of the wicked dead. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 20 verses 11 through 15, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face Earth and heavens fled away. There was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small, and great stand before God. And the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things that were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell lived the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now you may say, preacher, when will this happen? This will happen at the end of the millennium. When Jesus comes at the rapture, only the saved people will come out of the grave. The sinner, the lost man, will remain in the grave till the end of the millennium. 
At the end of the millennium, that man will come out of the grave. God will bring him out. And he'll stand before God. There won't be one Christian standing there, not one. All of them will be sinners. And they'll stand there in that old sinful, wicked body they died in. If a man died beat up and bloody and, and uh, died in that manner, he'll stand there in that old body. He's standing there in that old diseased body in which he's resurrected in. He's coming out of the grave, going back in the body in which he died in. And he'll stand before God at the great white throne. There won't be one saved person there, nobody but sinners. It's a great white throne of God out in space. And God is going to judge these poor lost sinners that died without God. Every unsaved man in the grave, he'll stay in that grave, his body will to that time. Every unsaved man that dies between now and then, he'll stay in that grave till that time. And then he'll come out and he'll stand before God to be judged. You may say, now preach Edwards, is God going to give him another chance? No, 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 no. God is not judging him to give him another chance. He had his chance on the earth and he didn't take and died and went to hell. God is not going to give him a second chance. There's no such thing as purgatory. That's a lie of the devil. God is not going to give him another chance. He'll stand at the judgment bar of God to be judged to determine his degree of punishment in hell. That has nothing to do with the time element. The time element is forever. But he will be punished by degrees. The more wicked he's been, the more he's going to be punished. There is a degree of punishment in hell. You better believe that. Some of sinners say, well, I'm going to hell. I might as well to steal and kill and rob and live like the devil going to hell anyway. Every evil thing you do is heaping up on your uh, degree of punishment in hell. The more wicked you are, the greater you're going to be punished. And that time is coming. That's why the judgment. There'd be no point of the judgment if there were not degrees of punishment in hell. That has nothing to do with the time element. It's what takes place in hell in that lake of fire. And you need to realize that. I have brought to you seven different judgments in the Bible. The Bible says upon the once to die, and after that the judgment. Many years ago, the governor had the privilege to go to a penitentiary in Ohio and there grant release for a number of prisoners. He went in and he had the names of some prisoners to be released, to pardon. And he gave them to the chaplain, and the chaplain was to call the names out. And the chaplain called out a name, Reuben Johnson. Reuben Johnson sat there like he didn't hear it. The chaplain said, Reuben Johnson, come forward. We have your pardon. You're to be released today. Reuben Johnson sat there. And the chaplain pointed at him and said, you, Reuben, you, you come forward. We have your pardon. Uh, you're, you're released today. We're going to let you out of prison. And finally he got up and with stooped shoulders, he'd been in prison so long, he came forward and there he received his pardon. And then he went back to his seat. And then when they started to go back to their cells, all of them stood and Reuben Johnson fell in line and started back with the old prisoners that had been with. The chaplain said, Reuben, Reuben, you shouldn't go back. You've been pardoned. You've been released. You don't need to go back into that cell. And they had to go take him by the arm and bring him out. And take you on the outside of the prison. He had headed back to the cell where it had been so long. That's where it is with a lot of sinners today. They have been pardoned from their sins. Their names have been written in heaven. But it seems awfully hard for them to stay out of the cesspools of iniquity. Oh, if your name has been written in heaven, you ought to praise God from here on in. And keep on rejoicing because you won't have to go to that great white throne judgment of God where sinners will be judged at the end of life's journey. God bless you. You've listened well. Let's stand to our feet. Our Father in heaven, I brought the message that you laid on my heart. God, no doubt there's hundreds, maybe thousands out in the radio listening audience that heard it. God, save somebody out there. Save some precious soul out there today. Then, Father, here in this auditorium, there may be some unsaved people need to get saved. There may be children, juniors, intermediates, young people, adults. God, have your way in this invitation. Lord, we'd like to see somebody saved today. Move mightily as we give the invitation. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Debbie's going to play for us. Now, you listen to me. As Debbie plays for us, if you're here unsaved, won't you come down here and get saved? If you're here and you've been saved, but you indifferent, backslid on God, now would be a good time to come back into fellowship. Uh, if you're here and you want to join this church, everybody needs a church home. 
You want to join this church, I mean every saved person. You want to join this church as your church home. Won't you come? You know whether or not God is speaking to you. You know whether or not you need to come. I'm not going to try to high pressure you. I want you to be obedient to God. Would you do what God tells you to do right now while we wait? Come on. Come on. You don't do it. You're going to leave your miserable. Do what God tells you. Come right on. God bless these is coming. Amen. Come right on now while we wait.